Okay, then we can continue with uh, talking about the models. Now we go back to the musculoskeletal part instead of the cardiac part. But as you saw already in the previous days, a lot of the things are very, very similar, although it's a different problem, maybe biological, medical, but the approaches and the way of doing things are very, very similar. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jérôme Noy, who is working here at a university, and he's doing mainly modeling of the uh, musculoskeletal system. But again, in this integrated approach where you go from data, experimental models, like in vivo and vitro models, and then to computational models and try to iterate through it in order to answer specific questions. Jérôme. Okay, I think. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for the for the introduction. So uh, the, the the talk uh, I will present, I try to to paste together so a lot of pieces of work that uh, we have accumulated in, in spine modeling so along uh, along the years, in order to build a, a consistent uh, a consistent story. And so as I, I hope you. you you remember the talk of uh, Karin Wurst uh, on Monday, where uh, she was mentioning nutrition as a, as a possible uh, important factor in, uh, in intervertebral uh, disc, uh, disc degeneration. And because intervertebral disc is, is avascular, it has few cells, a lot of extracellular matrix, and the maintenance of this matrix so depends on the capacity of those uh, few cells to have uh, anabolic activity which will, of course, uh, in turn depend on the, um, on the availability of, of nutrients to, the, to these cells. And the, the availability of the nutrients, so as, as Karin already mentioned, uh, basically comes from the, mostly from the peripheral vasculature, but on the top and bottom of the intervertebral disc through these interfaces that we call uh, the end plate. And then uh, you, you need to have a diffusion of, uh, of, the small, of the solutes, so typically oxygen and, and glucose, so uh, through the disc. And, um, and this diffusion should allow solutes uh, achieving so the center of the disc in order to feed the cells here. And at the same time, so the cell uh, produce, uh, make glycolytic uh, respiration, and then they produce, they produce acid lactic that contribute to lower the pH and this acid lactic should also be uh, eliminated so through diffusion and via the, this, these end plates. Uh, <clears throat> so some people so have cultured uh, cell, cells in vitro and, and what they have seen is that, so here you have a reference of, uh, of one millimolar of glucose and uh, when they, they when they, they provoke uh, partial or total glucose deprivation, what they see is that the cells of uh, the center of the disc so, uh, start to lose their ability to uh, express important uh, cellular uh, <coughs> matrix proteins, such as proteoglycans and collagen type 2, so which are uh, the main component of the, of the center of the intervertebral disc that ensures so, uh, the proper function of, of the disc and so a proper physical environment uh, for the cells uh, of the disc. And uh, moreover, so uh, concentration of 0.5 millimolar of, of glucose so has been identified as critical. So uh, below uh, 0.5 millimolar, basically you have this decrease in, in expression. So no specific difference between uh, complete deprivation and this partial uh, deprivation. And it has also been shown that below this uh, critical, uh, critical concentration, so uh, the, the cells uh, start to die because along the time because they're just uh, starving. So <clears throat> of course, this problem of uh, nutrition is also affected by mechanical loads. So the cell of the intervertebral disc, like any cell of the musculoskeletal system, are indeed highly responsive to, uh, to mechanical loads. So you have two direct uh, ways of response. So there is a direct mechanical transduction, so which involves so basically so the signaling through the, the integrins that are attached to the matrix, and then remodeling of the cytoskeleton, and uh, that sends signal to the nucleus, and so in the end uh, we come to biosynthesis. And then there is another pathway that is called uh, has been called indirect uh, mechanical transduction. 
And this indirect mechanism transduction basically uh, involves, uh, involves the nutrition. So imagine that, uh, imagine the solids that diffuse through the intervertebral uh, disk matrix, which is, uh, which is a sponge, so it has pores, and these pores are, are filled with, uh, with fluid, and then the solids have to make their way through these, uh, through these pores. So when, you're, when you compress uh, the intervertebral disk, when you compress the sponge, so what you're doing is that you're contributing to collapse the pores, and so the water flow out, so basically, you have less medium to allow the solute to uh, diffuse through the, through the tissue and then uh, to, come to, to come to the cells. Then, of course, the ability of the disc to, to deform or the degree to which it will deform under specific uh, external loads then will depend on the uh, tissue properties, okay, so typically uh, the permeability, so uh, the fluid, uh, fluid content, so the porosity, the fixed charge density, so the, 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 the amount of proteoglycans that uh, controls the osmotic pressure. And all those parameters so depend on uh, the interplay between three major components, uh, which are the proteoglycans, the collagen type two, and, uh, and the water. And once we have uh, basically altered the tissue properties, we have altered the nutrition, we follow this path, we have a remodeling of the matrix, and then, of course, this remodeling of the matrix, so further alters the tissue properties, and, and we enter, basically, or we, or we expect to enter in a catabolic uh, loop that might be particularly relevant to disc pathogenesis. So the nutrition is known to be limited in the intervertebral disc, so gradients have been, uh, have been assessed. However, uh, whether this indirect mechanotransduction is really important to, to the intervertebral disc pathogenesis, it's mostly an educated guess. There are no specific strong evidences so about this, especially, uh, especially in vivo. So there have been a lot of uh, in vitro studies, so cell cultures and, and, and organ cultures uh, more recently that brought some evidences However, in order to uh, extrapolate all these evidences to the in vivo situation, then we have to interpolate those evidences, which is particularly difficult. And so here comes basically the strengths of, of, numerical, uh, of numerical modeling. So you, you're generating uh, equations that allows you to explain different, different evidences taken from here, from there, and then from this interpretation then you hope to establish so an educated guess about the relationship between those evidences. And when you have this educated guess, so you have all the tools in order to try to produce new evidences through, uh, through new, new experiments. So with this in mind, the specific question that, uh, that we have been uh, tackling is, so whether nutrition can contribute to this degeneration and whether disk degeneration can uh, alter nutri nutrition and of course the mechanisms through which we, we, we can have this, uh, this feedback loop. So here in terms of modeling, we are tackling uh, three major challenges. So uh, one challenge is to have this tissue model that can capture the degenerative changes. When you have degenerative changes, so you have changes in uh, proteoglycan contents, in uh, water contents, you also have uh, damage. So here you can see, for example, cracks. Uh, in, the, in the matrix, then we need to uh, couple so this composition and, and, and biomechanical aspects so to, to the analysis of the solute uh, transport uh, to the disk. And then, of course, everything should be in the end related to uh, cell biophysics and, and cell activity. So in order to make a stronger link uh, with biological uh, evidences. So uh, I will start with the kind of models that uh, we've been using in order to uh, have uh, tissue models able to capture degenerative changes. So we, we base the modeling approach on uh, per hyper uh, elasticity. So we have, so in the center, we have the, the gel-like part of the disk, so which is mainly collagen type two and, 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 proto, and protoglycans. And so on the, on the periphery, you have uh, fiber-reinforced uh, structures. So basically, 
that the function of the disk uh, is shaped by the ability to uh, develop uh, strong hydrostatic pressures when the disk is ex loaded externally here. And these hydrostatic pressure put on attractions these, uh, these fibers. And then you achieve a very strong mechanical strength. At the same time, you can have a very controlled flexibility because uh, the water is able to flow out if you have slow movements or static positions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So these are the mechanical uh, features we need to capture. So uh, we basically so have uh, simulate uh, a, a solid matrix and we derive the stress of solid matrix from this potential with elasticity coefficients. And uh, to the stress that we derive from here, so we add uh, pore pressure stress, which represent the, 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 the mechanical contribution of the water. Uh, that depends uh, so on the pore pressure within uh, capillaries that is related to the permeability or the hydraulic conductivity of the tissue and the ability of water to flow out when you load the disc. And it also depends on the osmotic pressure, so which is mostly due to uh, the presence of protoglycans and with their fixed charge density that can attract uh, water. And then this water that is attracted through osmotic effects so also contribute to the, to the mechanical disc mechanics. So in the Andalus uh, fibrosis, we have similar approach, but we still take into account uh, the fibers with these additional terms. So this is state-of-the-art uh, constitutive uh, equation. This is also, this general framework is also uh, completely uh, state-of-the-art. And uh, basically through this reinforcement, so what we will see that what is important to capture is interaction, is the local interaction that we will have between the, between the two tissues. And we'll comment on this uh, later. So uh, based on this state of the art model, so what we, we customized it a little bit uh, because uh, we have seen that uh, those equations would be valid for uh, non-damaged and, and, and healthy tissue. As soon as you start to have cracks within the tissue, so you affect in a different way um, the stiffness of uh, the resistance of the tissue to uh, volumetric uh, deformations and to uh, changes uh, uh, of shape. So uh, based on, uh, on micromechanics, uh, explore theoretical explorations so reported by uh, Dormion and, and Kondo uh, years ago, uh, so we could uh, derive these uh, damaged and uh, stiffness parameters, so shear modulus and bulk modulus, uh, in function of uh, damage parameter which is related to uh, typical uh, crack density and, and crack shape. So we can also relate these damage parameters so basically to the porosity. So you have, you have a crack that has a specific shape that can open and then water can also uh, flow in. So through this damage parameter, we basically establish a link between tissue damage and uh, so um, uh, elastic parameters and so uh, pyromechanical, uh, pyromechanical parameters. So in order to uh, assess whether this, this new model was, uh, was reasonable, so what we've done is that uh, we went into uh, specimen-specific uh, modeling. So we got uh, degenerated spine, uh, calaveric spine specimens that were uh, tested, uh, tested in vitro, and they were so imaged. So from the clinical images, we rebuilt, uh, rebuilt uh, models, and we got intervertebral discs of different shapes and, and different uh, degeneration, uh, degeneration grades. So this is a Pierman uh, degeneration grade. So here you have uh, almost healthy, moderately degenerated, and uh, with advanced, advanced degeneration. And um, then we, we, we looked how our model parameters were evolving with degeneration so as to be able to reproduce mechanical behavior of, of the specimen. And here we got, a, we got a very good surprise. So we assessed our undamaged uh, stiffness. We, sh we see that uh, our undamaged stiffness is so uh, basically we're generally increasing with, uh, with the degeneration. And indeed, when you have degeneration, what, what you have in an intent to reproduce the tissue, you have production of collagen type 1, which is called fibrosis. Uh, so that generally uh, stiffens, uh, stiffens the tissue. However, at the same time, uh, we also know that so the change of uh, intervertebral disc uh, stiffness with the degeneration 
is, has always been a debate. There are some people that say that the disk softens with degeneration and other people that say that the disk uh, um, stiffens with degeneration. And what is, what is happening when you look a little bit closer to, into the literature is that you see that from almost healthy to moderately degenerated, you tend to have uh, a stiffening of the intervertebral disc. But when you pass uh, from uh, healthy to uh, advanced degeneration, you tend indeed to have a softer intervertebral disc. And this is basically what we were able to capture through the, through the accumulation of damage. We can see that the accumulation of damage was not too high, so from, for grade two and grade three, but we had a dramatic jump up to uh, for grade four, so in order to, to reproduce uh, the uh, to reproduce the mechanical experiments. And then, of course, at the same time, we predicted also uh, a drop in the in the swelling pressure, in the fixed charge density, where we got so result that were in nicely aligned with the literature, and we got also a drop of, of porosity with degenerated porosity of around a uh, bit more than 70% of water, which is also uh, commonly reported uh, in the literature. So uh, through uh, independent experiments, so we've, we validated uh, our model, so within a full uh, lumbar, spine, uh, lumbar spine model, so we simulated, uh, simulated forward flexion, and then, so we had our several disks uh, that had uh, degeneration-specific mechanical properties, and then we've, we've, we have been able so to validate the deformation of each disk, so in function of the level and, uh, and the degeneration uh, grade. So, uh, of course, we have done this uh, before we, ha we had this model, but this is th the story of the presentation uh, go in this order, that so then, then when we have this kind of disk model, so what's, what's the, the, what we have to do is to basically couple so to the diffusion of, uh, of the solutes, of the nutrition, of the nutrients, and then to uh, the reactions that would produce at, uh, at the cell level that will also contribute to the, um, to the local and, and current concentration of the solutes. So here we have basically so uh, a reaction diffusion uh, equation, and what we so we have the diffusion term. So we can uh, basically uh, couple the diffusion term so uh, to the current porosity of of, uh, of the tissue. So when when you mechanically deform the tissue, so you change the porosity, and then you change the diffusion coefficient so of the of the different solutes. And uh, for, the, uh, for the reaction, so basically, we have those, uh, we have those empirical uh, laws that come from, the, that come from experimental uh, literature uh, where people have tracked, so the, um, basically, the, the consumption of uh, oxygen, of glucose, and the production of, of lactate. So in function of uh, the pH, the uh, current uh, oxygen uh, concentration, and of uh, the porosity and, and of uh, the, cell, the cell density. So this is the overall scheme that we follow to couple the mechanics then to, to, this, uh, to this equation. So this is a, this is a weak coupling. So we first uh, solve so our pro-mechanical analysis so, and extract the current porosities. We also extract the displacement fields in order to capture the change in diffusion distances. And uh, we enter basically in this, in this loop. So we solve the equation for oxygen and for uh, lactate. Then for glucose, we also update uh, the pH. And once we have solved those equations, so basically what we can do, so based on experimental evidences, we can infer on um, the probabilities that cell uh, have to die in function of the current uh, glucose level, pH level, and, and, and time. So here we have a rather complex model. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's very difficult to validate uh, this integrated uh, mechanotransport model of the, of the intervertebral disc because it's very difficult to get, uh, to obtain controlled uh, evidences. So the thing that uh, you usually do in modeling when you can actually assess uh, what you have is sensitivity analysis. 
So you do a sensitivity analysis, you check what are the parameters that are uh, that most influence your predictions, and then you try to focus basically on those parameters, so to link more, mechanistic, more mechanistically those parameters to your system. And this is what we've, we've done. Huh? And then we've seen that uh, basically the porosity and uh, the swelling pressure mostly affected the distribution of solutes into the disk when you do mechanical, you apply mechanical loads, and as well as, as the cell density. So the next step uh, was basically to further refine the, the osmo per hyperelastic model. And through, uh, through the Dolan theory, we were basically uh, able to uh, relate the osmotic pressure to, uh, to the fixed charge density of the proteoglycans and this fixed charge density of the proteoglycans also through uh, empirical equations so can be related directly to the content of the proteoglycans. Uh, through this theory, uh, you also uh, split uh, the total water content into water content that is uh, affected by the osmotic pressure, which is called the extra fibrillar uh, water, and to the water content uh, that contributes, that is uh, driven by um, capillarity uh, movements, so by, by Darcy's law, which would be uh, the intrafibrillar water content that depends on the where is it? Uh, on the collagen content. So here we basically uh, have an updated model that were important parameters that we can directly calibrate from biochemical measurements. And this is what we've done for uh, healthy disks and uh, for moderately degenerated uh, intervertebral disks. And then we use this model so to simulate uh, seven days of Typical, uh, typical physical activity, and we of course coupled our, um, our, nutrition, uh, our nutrition model. And then we assessed through the sensitivity, so it's through the design of experiments, sensitivity analysis, so we assessed which were uh, the biochemical uh, components that mostly affected the nutrition of the local nutrition of the disk cells um, that mostly affected the local uh, nutrition of, of the disk cells when this component was switched from grade one to grade three, so from healthy to moderately degenerated. So in general, our uh, glucose concentrations uh, were always uh, higher than the currently non threshold for cell death, so we didn't have any, any cell death. However, when, when any of the parameters was switched from grade one to grade three, so uh, we always, we're always reducing our glucose concentrations. And here came the, the interesting aspects. If you were looking, so, and uh, what was happening in the anterior annulus fibrosis or the posterior annulus fibrosis, and more specifically at the, at the interface indeed, uh, you were seeing that uh, the water content of the nucleus pulposus was dramatically uh, affecting so, uh, the glucose availability to the cells uh, in, those, uh, in those area, independently on the proteoglycan contents. So this was very interesting because uh, in general, when you assess this degeneration or, or when you say that you start to have this degeneration, you accept that you already had a depletion of the proteoglycans, which is one of the first biochemical uh, sign of degeneration. But here, this, this basically this reduction of availability of glucose to the cells within the central part is independent of the depletion of the proteoglycans. It's only, it's only the water. So it, it, come, it basically uh, brought us, I will come back to this later, it uh, basically brought us to, to a question that what can provoke this, uh, this uh, degeneration of the center of the disc independently on the proteoglycan, uh, on the proteoglycan depletion. So when you're physically active, uh, during the day, you're expelling water, okay? You have uh, almost 16 hours of activities. If you're healthy, you sleep about eight hours per day. And during these eight hours, you're basically recovering the fluid. So all the fluid exchanges that take place, they mostly take place also through these, uh, through these end plates. So basically what, what we've done is that uh, we also wanted to be able to simulate the degeneration of this end plate. And specifically, there is a very thin cartilage layer here, the importance of which has been often overlooked because this is not a tissue 
that can be easily assessed biochemically or, or, or histochemically because it's, it's, it's very thin. And, uh, but we can use modeling to do that. So we basically further expanded so the model, uh, so by having a composition dependent, uh, dependence of the permeability of this, uh, of this tissue. And uh, so what, what we found, so we could validate the model, we could see basically that uh, basically we had permeability increase when we had depletion of proteoglycans and collagen, which agreed with the literature. And when we imposed so mean composition, we were also able to predict the mean permeability uh, according to values that had been measured in the literature. So now we have our composition dependence of the center of the disk, uh, of the periphery of the disk, and of this uh, thin cartilage uh, layer. So we can take biochemical measurements in the literature in order to play with uh, the relative composition of each component. And we assess the effect on uh, the overall uh, water content uh, calculated in the, center, in the center of the disk that we have found that mostly affects the nutrition of the cells, so in those, uh, in those areas. And uh, here, big surprise. So we've seen that, so this is a healthy case. This is when uh, we have basically all the tissues uh, degenerated. So of course you lose water, but if you only simulate the degeneration of this layer of water exchange, you're basically dropping, making the water content drop. So uh, at a very similar level to the fully degenerated, uh, to the fully degenerated case. So, which basically suggests that we should have a very closer look uh, at to this. And if you look then what happens in terms of uh, glucose concentration at the, at the interface, so basically you see that when you're, when you're simulating a uh, so degeneration of the, this tissue, you're around one millimolar of glucose, a little bit below. You don't achieve 0.5, but when you have all tissues degenerated, so including the cell, then basically you're, you're starting, to, you're starting to, to provoke cell death so into, your, uh, into your organ. So really highlighting so the, 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 the dramatic importance of this thin tissue. Now, uh, of course, here we are not taking into account uh, aging. We're just simulating so uh, degeneration and, and, and we don't care uh, whether it's aging, whether it's accelerated degeneration, but we try to infer on accelerated degeneration. So we could also use this model in order to, uh, in order to target a little bit, uh, in order to target more uh, aging process. If you remember the talk of Karin, Karin was making the difference between what was uh, normal aging, so you're, we are all degenerating, but that's, that's within the normality. And, and, and you can have accelerated degeneration. So, so here we found some, uh, we found evidences in the literature that uh, depending on the oxygen level, so the production of uh, the protoglycans uh, was basically, uh, basically lowered, okay? So this is what we've, did, what we've done. So we have our fixed charge density, which is a parameter of the poor mechanical model. And then uh, we've started to uh, make this fixed charge density depending on the time. So uh, depending on uh, the um, a depletion due to the half-life of the molecules of the protoglycans and, uh, and function of the production of the protoglycans by the, by the cells. So we have a, a production rate so we assume that in a healthy conditions and uh, with, uh, with a nice nutritional environment, basically uh, we should have a homeostatic preservation of this fixed charge density. And then we can calculate this, uh, this full production. And then based on those evidences, so we, we make the production, so switch from one value to 80% of this value. So when we have uh, low, oxygen, uh, low oxygen contents. So we put everything into the mechanotransport uh, disk model and uh, we basically simulate up to 28 years of daily uh, physical activity. And uh, what we see is that in the center of the disk, we're starting to lose uh, protoglycans. And if we look what happens 
after um, a little bit more than 21, uh, 21 years, uh, we start to find um, a fixed charge density or proteoglycan contents that corresponds to what is being measured in uh, grade three intervertebral disc in the normal population. Not in the population that is considered as um, pathologic, I mean, normal aging. And, and now if we consider that our time zero is a fully mature intervertebral disc, so you have a fully mature intervertebral disc around uh, the age of 25 years old, plus minus, plus minus some years. So basically it brings you to an age of around 45, 50 years old. And indeed there are uh, clinical evidences that this is the age at which you have most prevalence of uh, grade three uh, intervertebral disc. However, when you you when when you have this uh, this kind of uh, this kind of when you simulate this kind of degeneration, so basically you you don't have cell death, so you're not expecting a dramatic acceleration of this, at least based on this kind of uh, at least based on this kind of, of modeling. So of course, here what we have. So we're, we're predicting uh, the nutritional environment in function of the mechanics, and we say, okay, that's uh, there is partial, there is no deprivation or there is partial deprivation. And then we can infer whether we will have cell death or no cell death. But between the dramatic event uh, of cell death and a healthy condition, many bi biological things can happen. So if the cells are stressed because of the nutrition or because of the combination of nutrition and the loads, through direct mechanotransduction, through direct stimulation, they can also start to produce inflammatory factors, uh, proteases that will enter into the loop of degeneration. So, so basically through the, the approach that I've shown formerly, we can infer on the importance of some tissues, but it's, it's very difficult to see whether we are not underestimating or overestimating what, what, what could happen and so to link the results to, the, to, to evidences, uh, biological evidences. So here what we did is that we further, we developed a lower scale level, which is an agent-based uh, model. So I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with the agents, but basically the agents, so you, you take an entity, which is an agent, okay, and the agent act as a single solver, as an independent solver. So you put rules, into this agent. So the solver resolves these rules, and then you can have different agents that have different rules, okay? And then you leave the agent interacting between each other, so cooperating. And the rules of one agent will start to affect basically uh, the solving of the other agent, etc. And you start to, uh, you start to generate so a stochastic and emergent uh, system which is more proper of the, of, the biological, uh, of the biological reality. And through these rules, as you will see, you can also, um, you can also um, input a lot of different uh, parameters much more easily than through finite element simulations where you should start to generate uh, strong couplings. So uh, basically we have our agent and then we made our agent sensitive to glucose, to oxygen, to lactate, to the hydrostatic pressure and uh, to, the, uh, to the porosity. And through these uh, environmental uh, parameters, so the agent regulates its um, simulated biological activity. So this would be basically the agent. So within the agent, we have different models to shape the biological activity. So uh, we have an immunopositivity uh, model, um, which is based on the Markov chain, and it basically relates uh, the probability to have the secretion of inflammatory factors in function of the intracellular production of inflammatory factors, and the same for the, for the, for the growth factors. Then we have a cell viability model. So basically the probability of cell viability before it was only shaped by the contents of glucose or, or, or the pH. So here it will also depend on the inflammatory cytokines that, uh, that will stimulate it. So the production of energy due to uh, respiration, for example, or to the growth factor will inhibit the probability of cells. Growth factors, of course, so inhibit. And you also have so retroalimentation, so cell death 
activates uh, cell deaths, which is something known in apoptosis. Uh, for the nutrition, so we gave up uh, the, the, the we gave up the phenomenological uh, the phenomenological equation that we had for the reaction in order to build a full Michaelis Menten uh, model where you take into account so uh, glucose intracellular glucose uh, transporters, and for the effect of loads, we also splitted basically the load into different descriptors so magnitude, uh, frequency, and, and amplitude and through a network based on uh, gated channels. So we are able to uh, make the difference uh, between the relative effects of each, uh, each load descriptor. And then we have a submodel, which is uh, the integration submodel within the agent, where uh, we make everything uh, interacting with everything. So black arrows are activation, uh, red arrows are, are, are inhibition. So the way we generate the network is based on what is commonly known from the, from the literature. So it's qualitative. And to make it uh, quantitative, so uh, we, use, uh, we use a kind of uh, Boolean, uh, integrated Boolean model. And the whole, uh, the, the entire, um, the entire uh, integration of the Boolean model so generates like a, a continuous model of uh, activations and uh, and inhibitions. And the good thing of this model, so we've set all the activation inhibition coefficients to uh, mean neutral values. Somehow we, we, don't, we didn't calibrate the model because the good thing of this model that has been developed for general purposes is that the qualitative behavior of the, of the network depends on the connectivity that you have put in the network, into the network. So we can directly assess whether our connectivity is reasonable or not uh, in relation to what is known in the, in the literature. And the final result of this network is uh, basically the expression of matrix proteins, collagen type 1, type 2, protoglycans, uh, matrix metalloproteases that basically depend on inflammatory cytokines and growth factors and energy stores so on, 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 the, on the nutrition. So, We've changed, we've taken the model, we've taken so the agents with all the intra, intracellular models, and then uh, through the immunopositivity models, the agents uh, release, uh, produce, and, uh, and uptake so inflammatory uh, cytokines and so growth factors. Uh, they also modify their nutritional uh, environment through the respiration, and then you start to have so agent cooperations. So we have about, uh, I think, 5,000 uh, agents collaborating and uh, we change the environmental pH and, and glucose. And, and we check the effect that it has on uh, the relative expression of the protoglycans and collagen type 2 and compare it to uh, cell culture uh, experiments. And through this, we've been able to basically validate so our model qualitatively because this is a relative uh, expression. And so we've been able to validate so the connectivity of uh, the connectivity of the network uh, that we have in order to have the sensitivity of the cells to a nutritional environment by integrating us so uh, very important biological, uh, biological components. So there is something very interesting that we've seen is that so in the, in the indirect mechanotransduction models that I've shown before, so we had repeatedly, when we were altering the model, we had repeatedly this concentration of one millimolar of, uh, of glucose. But it was very difficult to achieve 0.5 millimolar in glucose unless you apply very extreme loads that generate uh, extreme uh, dehydration of, uh, of, the t of the tissue. And, but then when we, when we ran the system's uh, biology model, we, we, we've seen that when we achieve this one millimolar of glucose, so these are completely independent simulations, uh, or we basically started to trigger some, uh, some catabolic, uh, some catabolic uh, events. So this is basically, this would be basically a very good reason in order not to go back into the experimental biology and do a better screening uh, of the glucose concentration effects because glucose concentrations around these concentrations, so between one and five, it has never, never been assessed before. And this is what I've said, and this is just an illustration that 
basically we're always around one uh, millimolar when we simulate aging or tissue, uh, so tissue degradation. So for example, only uh, the degeneration of this, uh, of this cell, so this goes through uh, indirect mechanical transduction. So now back to the system's biology model, another level of assessment since we are able to take into account the effect of the mechanical loads. So based on, uh, do you remember that Karin mentioned the study uh, where, uh, where an orthopedic surgeon agreed to have a pressure sensor into his intervertebral disc? So, so we, retook basically this, uh, we retook basically the result of, uh, of this study and we imposed to the model, so the, the inter intradiscal pressure, so associated to the different activities that the surgeon was doing. And here we also got something that we were very happy, is that, uh, so these basically bars is no load, so we can take it as a, as a control. And with respect to this control, when we simulate walking, uh, we're basically, uh, we're basically f uh, favoring the production of extracellular matrix. Uh, we are limiting uh, the production of, uh, we're limiting the production of uh, catabolic uh, factors. We're increasing the production of, uh, of growth factors. And uh, I know there are some spine surgeons in the room and indeed walking is one of the physical activity that is uh, generally recommended for, 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 for person that have uh, low back disorders but, but have to keep uh, being active. So these are uh, the conclusions uh, that we had based on, on, on all these results. So uh, basically deformation induced local dehydration um, basically is, is seems critical to, to, disc, uh, to disc nutrition. So for standard disc sizes, uh, nutrition controlled uh, protoglycan depression so seems to control a natural uh, aging uh, process but this is different from accelerated degeneration. This is so what the model says. And the early degeneration of the cartilage uh, end plate, so because of this, uh, is, seems to have a, a very dramatic effect and can really contribute to accelerated uh, degeneration. And this needs to be, to, to be looked uh, experimentally. And then, of course, we've seen so the power of uh, systems biology modeling so in order to uh, basically couple the scale, so what would happen at the, at the organ tissue level and then at the lower level where you can very establish tight relationships uh, with biological uh, evidences, so based on, on cell cultures that are otherwise very difficult to interpret uh, in terms of what happens into the, into the organ or, or in vivo. And this is, Another thing, huh? that's we were speaking about patient specificity. In, uh, so this is some slide that I, I did during uh, Blanca, <laughs> Blanca stock. So patient specificity, and, and here there is something that the, the eternal question: huh? Does size matter? So the uh, answer is uh, yes, size matters. Okay. So uh, so the specimen uh, specimen specific simulation that we've done. So we have, so we found out that we had uh, intervertebral disc. With a, with a height of around uh, 10 millimeters, that would be the standard disc height in the standard population. And, but we have some discs uh, that, were, that, that were very thick, uh, with heights of about 15 millimeter. And by coupling the nutrition model uh, to, the, to the mechanical model, so independently on the degeneration grade that is being simulated, we've seen that in the center of the disc, because of lack of nutrition, so basically we can already alter uh, alter the cell viability, yeah, to, uh, so we can have up to 40% of, uh, of cell death. So, which means that there are some patients that we don't know why, but uh, they have spontaneous dehydration of the disc. Patients that can be very young, around 20, uh, 30, uh, 30 years old. And, and here, so one additional clue that the model can bring is that whether it would be correlated with the height of the disc whether a patient with very large intervertebral disc wouldn't be prone to uh, accelerated degeneration because of uh, high, diffusion, uh, high diffusion distances. So thank you for, for your attention. I would like to, to particularly uh, thank uh, so, uh, these collaborators who have respectively contributed to many aspects of, uh, of what I have shown to the funding uh, entities and to all the external uh, collaborators that we had. And um, 
happy to take questions. Thank you very much for this interesting overview and a very, very elaborative model. Uh, maybe one thing is like you, you regularly said, like you do your model, you get your, your uh, variables or parameters from experiments. Uh, what is your opinion? These things, can you find it in the literature? Do you have to find collaborators that can do your experiments? Do you need to organize the experiments yourself? How do you see it as like a modeling researcher? What's good approaches? Mm -hmm. So uh, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, for, the, for all what are the, the mechanical parameters, uh, there, is, there is a lot of things already in the, in the literature. And um, by playing with sensitivity analysis, uh, you, can, you can basically assess the effect of the variability of your, on your prediction. So basically, you can, uh, you can target the kind of prediction that is less affected by this variability or the kind of prediction is most affected by this variability. And then you will go more in detail into some specific parameters. So if you go more in detail into the specific parameters, uh, you can be lucky. You can find a narrower literature that targets those parameters. Or you have to develop collaboration. So here we've been lucky. We have developed a collaboration with, uh, with Professor Keita Ito at the Eindhoven uh, University of Technology, who were working basically on uh, composition-dependent uh, disk modeling. Uh, as for the systems biology model and, uh, and, um, and the relationship with uh, in vitro experiments or organ culture experiments, it's a little bit tricky because uh, there is a very strong variability in the, in the literature between the, the conditions of, uh, of cell cultures. So the origin of the cells, in general, you have already degenerated cells that, that are senescent. So we assume that our cells initially are healthy. So when you have healthy cells, basically in general, what you, ha you have bovine or ovine cells. You have an animal model, not a human model. So here it becomes a little bit more tricky to, to do it yourself because of uh, regulation and, uh, and, and also to find out uh, collaborations. So for, him, for healthy cells, so uh, as far as we know, uh, there are very few persons who do that. You have to go outside Europe, you have to go to Canada. <laughs> and so we have established contact already with, with those persons. But then, of course, everything starts to depend on, on funding yeah? because you have to start to pay, uh, to pay things to do that. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Then I think okay. We'll continue. Yeah.